Hello and welcome to the program. I am your host, Innocent Simosa. It's good to be in your company. The article is now in session. Of course, today we are not uh, in studio. We are coming to you from the capital here in Pretoria. On to this now. The Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, Gwede Mandashe, told Parliament that South Africa should consider uh, importing all crude oil from Russia. You know that the challenge that South Africans have been facing with the petrol hikes, uh, it has been really devastating. And of course, the minister went as far as to say that these challenges that we're currently facing, it is of course precipitated or they were caused by the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. But to talk to us further, I am joined by Alex, he's of, uh, Alexander. He is actually representing the embassy here in South Africa. Alexandra, thank you so very much for creating time. Yes. Thank you very much. Welcome to. All right. Uh, perhaps let me begin by asking you to give us a historical context of this conflict. Why are we here today? So uh, I'll give you the brief uh, context because yes, uh, will we'll require some yeah. uh, historic background uh, mm -hmm. to understand what's what's exactly going on now mm -hmm. between Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. So, uh, as a short, I can speak for hours about this, but yeah. uh, to to you know to save time, yes. uh, let's stick to two thousand. Uh, let's stick to nineteen ninety one mm -hmm. when Soviet Union collapsed. Yeah. Uh, Ukraine became an independent state, mm -hmm. uh, and well, so this independent foreign policy, but we kind of preserved uh, good relations between Russia and, and Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, for a number of reasons, uh, from humanitarian to economic and industrial, yeah. uh, because the Soviet economy and industry was designed in a way to involve uh, Soviet republics in one production chains. Yeah. So, and we are, were deeply intertwined economically, mm -hmm. culturally, even linguistically, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, on the level of people to people relations. Yeah. Because even today, despite everything was going on, uh, Russians and we still consider Ukrainians as yeah. brotherly nation. Yeah. And what's going on is first and foremost a tragedy to mm -hmm. Russians and Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So, but since 1991, uh, NATO has begun sort of, let's call, let's call it that way, courting mm. uh, Ukraine uh, because of its uh, geographical proximity mm. to, to Russia. Mm. And uh, in, back in the Soviet era, NATO promised Russia, that uh, Soviet Union back yeah. then, not to expand NATO further eastwards yeah. when the Germanys, the Eastern Germany, Western Germany mm. reunified as one state. Yeah. So we were promised not to see NATO moving any closer. Mm. To the east. To the east, yes, yeah. to, to Russia. Mm. Nonetheless, uh, the West just violated that promise. Mm. And since 1991, when uh, the Soviet Union was gone, mm. uh, they moved closer and closer with their military infrastructure, troops, uh, other military equipment. So there equipment. were agreements written down that you will not expand to the east. There was no written agreement, okay. uh, but here's the deal. That's what NATO is still saying to us, that there was no written agreement to this. Okay. But there were written uh, proofs, written okay. evidence mm -hmm. that the promise was made. Okay. That there, were, uh, there was a certain historical period when the West proceeded from that understanding that we had, an we had a deal. Yeah. Nonetheless, when, when the USSR was gone, NATO, uh, well, apparently felt um, like ruling the world, winners of the Cold War, mm. they started moving NATO closer to yeah. to Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, they kept us kept saying that it's not against our country, but well, it is against because NATO was created as well as an offensive tool against uh, Soviet bloc. Yeah. Um, so they moved closer and closer. We reminded them of that promise. Mm. Uh, they pretended that they forgot about it or promised never existed. Mm. Uh, the fact remains the fact. They, they moved closer, creating an imminent threat to, to Russia's Russia. security, mm. yes. Uh, we said on numerous occasions that moving to Ukraine, as close to Ukraine, mm. uh, would cause an imminent threat, like, as, as imminent as possibly, yeah. um, to Russia's statehood, to Russia's security. So this is a red line. Yeah. 
this is the line you should you should not cross mm -hmm. because we'll have to respond mm -hmm. uh, in, in some way. Uh, this warnings were disregarded mm -hmm. by the West because of his uh, its feeling of complacency, yeah. uh, sort of. Uh, so they continued the joint drills mm -hmm. with 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 Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, all these thirty years from 90, starting from 1991. They conducted uh, joint drills. Uh, they were like joint missions, and so they they built relations. Yeah. Closer to uh, our era, more present day, in 2014, mm -hmm. and a constitutional coup mm -hmm. uh, happens in Kiev yeah. because uh, of the um, Maidan protest in 2013, which started in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, because of these protests, well, the situation got destabilized, mm -hmm. and the government of Ukraine, the then President Yanukovych, decided to step down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they signed an agreement, the opposition and the current, the then current government of Ukraine, they signed an agreement of peaceful transition of power. Mm -hmm. uh, this agreement was guaranteed by European powers, okay. Fr France, Germany and Poland. Okay. On the very next day after this agreement was signed, mm. opposition just tore it apart and took the power by force. Mm. Russia dragged the attention of the Western powers, of the guaranteeing powers, like mm and ask the question, the simplest question you can possibly ask in this situation of what's going on. Yeah. Is this a coup d'etat? Mm -hmm. Why are you not doing anything? Mm -hmm. uh, EU responded, well, with nothing, basically. So well, it's, it's just, well, it's matters of democracy. Mm -hmm. Coup d'etat is nothing with democracy yeah. because a legitimate government came to power. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two things happened. Uh, Crimea first declared independence and then decided to join Russian Federation. Yeah. It's a topic in its own right. Uh, so, uh, well, if you wish, we can speak about Crimea later. Yeah. And then the eastern region, uh, Lugansk, Lugansk region and Donetsk region, commonly known as Donbas, yeah. uh, I mean, collectively known uh, as Donbas, uh, they decided that they, well, they will not support this government because, well, they never elected this government in the first place. Mm -hmm. But instead of fair dialogue, instead of, uh, let's call it recon reconciliation, instead sure. of looking for a compromise, looking for this mutually acceptable solution mm -hmm. to the current situation, Kyiv authorities responded with fire. Yeah. They used armed forces against these republics. Yeah. They had no armies, they had no means of defending themselves, so they had to form a people's militia. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of Russians uh, ethnic Russians and uh, Russians by nationality, I mean the people who hold Russian passports. Yeah. We had to respond to this because our, our, our citizens were in danger. Yeah, I, I, I guess you're right. The, the history is quite deep and it, 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 it goes really... Yeah, and I'll, I'll just, well, just to finish up, I'll yeah. have a larger strokes in this. Yeah. Sort of story. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, then the, well, they responded with fire and they've been attacking Donbas. Mm -hmm for eight years. Mm -hmm. They've been shelling Donbas, they've been killing innocent people. It's it's a massacre of mm -hmm. uh, both Russian and Ukrainians and all people just happen to be in Donbas. Mm -hmm. They attacked, they still do, they attack civilian infrastructure, they kill innocent people. The Ukrainian side uh, always, well, it tends to present this figure of 14,000 people died in Eastern Ukraine, mm -hmm. conveniently forgetting that the majority of these 14,000 mm -hmm. are innocent people of Donbas killed by Ukrainian army and uh, Nazi and ultranationalist units that's been incorporated in this army. Mm. We'll speak about Nazi later, it's, mm. a, it's, it's a whole topic. Mm. So for eight years, Russia has been trying to drag attention uh, to, to this situation because it was a massacre, a whole genocide mm -hmm. uh, of Russian population in Donbas, but the West responded with nothing. Mm -hmm. They pretended not to notice anything that's happening in Donbas. Yeah. Western leaders came to Kiev, mm -hmm. uh, greeted their presidents, being Petro Poroshenko, uh, came uh, came power after Yanukovych and Vladimir Zelensky, the yes. incumbent president. Mm -hmm. They praised him, they greeted him, and uh, thanked and praised him for democratic reforms, both uh, mm -hmm. Poroshenko and Zelensky. Mm -hmm. Praising for democratic reforms while the military of this country killing its own citizens. Mm -hmm. And there was a political solution found, mm -hmm. the Minsk agreements. Yeah. But Ukraine, feeling the support of the collective West, mm -hmm. Uh, just outright abandoned mm. fulfilling these agreements. They said it themselves, even President Zelensky mm. said that he didn't like a single arc article in, in, in this, uh, in this mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. Well, to, my, to, my, to Russia's understanding, the question is far beyond liking something. Mm. It's an agreement Ukraine is signatory to. Yeah. 
they try to put the blame on Russia, well, typically, uh, for Russia is not fulfilling Minsk agreement. But I should, I should point out for our distinguished audience that Russia is not a site to yeah. Minsk agreement. Mm. Okay. So it has no obligation to fulfill anything. It's not a site. Mm. But Ukraine, on the other hand, is a site of agreement, but it doesn't fulfill it. Mm. So, and for eight years, this genocide of uh, Russian people and Ukrainian people, for that matter, in Donbas has been going on with full acquiescence uh, of the West. And in 2020, uh, uh, all the while, NATO was still uh, you know, crawling yeah. uh, closer to Ukraine, established new cooperation formats and stuff. Uh, all the while saying that Russia you should not worry because Ukraine does not qualify as a NATO member now. Mm. Well, the key word here is now, because... Meaning that in the future they might. Exactly, yeah. because strategically it doesn't change anything for Russia. If it qual doesn't qualify today, nothing stops the West to make it qualify tomorrow yeah. or a week later. Mm -hmm. We can't uh, just wake up every morning and check whether Ukraine qualifies or not. Mm. Besides, uh, we are concerned not about formal membership, mm. because even cooperation with NATO to the extent that would allow NATO to deploy heavy missile equipment or other um, destructive weapons in territory of Ukraine, in proximity of Russia, yeah. is still a threat, mm -hmm. regardless mm -hmm. yeah. whether Ukraine is a NATO member or not. Mm -hmm. Which is why in December 2021, mm -hmm. we came up, uh, Russia's side has come up with the uh, draft uh, agreement on security measures. Yeah. Basically, the idea was for NATO to pull back mm -hmm. for, from Russia and to find a mutually acceptable solution for both Europeans, or I mean the Westerners, the collective West, mm -hmm. for Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Ukrainian side says that NATO is a mean of bolstering their defenses. Mm. Saying that, they sort of shrug off all other options of yeah. bolstering their defense. NATO is not mm. the only option to bolster your defense. Yeah. And, uh, well, speaking of def defensive alliance, mm. that they, NATO just bringing this up, NATO never brought any stability, nor when intervened. Well, yeah. think Yugoslavia in 1999. They just destroyed the country, ruined its statehood. Even here in Africa, Libya, mm. Libyan state was also destroyed in 2011 by NATO intervention. Mm. So NATO, from Russia's standpoint, NATO is not a stabilizing factor. On the contrary, it's destabilizing. Yeah. So we came up with the draft agreements on security measures to find, uh, as an attempt uh, to find a mutually acceptable solution. Mm. After 30 years since 1991, talking to NATO, Washington, Kiev of not expanding of how to find a peaceful way of coexisting. Mm. But all these years, including 2021, what we got in response was nothing but arrogance and complete disregard to our legitimate concerns mm. about our security, complete disregard to our positions and to our interests. Mm. Uh, they even told us that it's none of our business, basically. But how come our security measures is not of our business? Yeah, it's beyond sense. common sense. Yeah, Besides, while we're still at the topic, um, Ukraine often says that, well, it's a sovereign state and it can decide uh, its future. Mm. True, it's a sovereign state. But um, first of all, Russia is also a sovereign state. Mm. It's not just a matter actually between Ukraine and Russia. There are other countries like Belarus, yeah. Poland, uh, other countries that surrounding the region. We're not alone. And uh, Thirdly, I should say. Secondly, it's about Ukraine and Russia. Thirdly, uh, it's being a sovereign state does not mean that but you only have... Before we get to the sovereignty of, mm -hmm. of, the, of, of Ukraine, uh -huh. perhaps let me just take you back to the conflict. Mm -hmm. right? uh, it would seem like uh, Ukraine is slowly losing this conflict, mm -hmm. but they continue to fight. Do you perhaps think that there is an outside force that is actually motivating uh, Ukraine to actually continue with the fight. Exactly. Uh, th there is a side force. It's called the West. Okay. Uh, because the West, I mean, Washington in particular and London, they are the prime beneficiaries of this conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's in their interest. What are they benefiting? Uh, well, they introduce sanctions against Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, have a pretext of um, abandoning all rules of fair play yes. and basically wage uh, economic and information and hybrid war in particular against Russia. Mm. Uh, and uh, it sort of tries to pin down all its geopolitical uh, rivals yeah. um, and provoking a global conflict. So do you think 
there's a general narrative out there that says that, or claim that says when all of this is done, nobody will invest in, in Russia. Do you think it's a, it's disingenuous? Mm, no, it's actually, no, I don't think that's, that's a correct assessment. I'm not an economist yeah. uh, or investment mm. uh, expert mm. by all means, but still, um, it actually, this, narr- this narrative mm. uh, goes hand, to, uh, hand by hand. Because you still have friends. Exactly. That's well, that's the matter I was about to bring up. Mm. Uh, it's it holds hand by hand uh, with narrative like Russia is stands alone, okay. and the entire world is against Russia. Mm. See, the West has a tendency of representing itself as the entire world. Yeah. The West is not the entire world. Mm. There are a lot of countries who, which have not introduced sanctions against us. Yeah. Uh, Russia is still a member of a lot of uh, powerful and. Uh, with great, uh, powerful uh, organizations with great potential for further development. Yeah. Uh, let's say uh, BRICS is yeah. a good example. Yeah. BRICS, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm. uh, CSTO, uh, Collective Security Treaty Organization, uh, we're still a member of the UN and yeah. UNSC mm. and uh, haven't been pushed away. We're still a member of G20 mm. and a lot of other uh, Eurasian, uh, Eurasian uh, in- integration projects. Yeah. So uh, countries of Latin America, Africa, mm. uh, Asia, they have their independent position. Mm. They don't follow the suit uh, mm. of the West. So West is trying to make an image mm. of the world against Russia, but it's West mm. against Russia, not, ag- not just against Russia in this mm. regard. Uh, it's, we'll speak about that later of how West is trying to uh, so, impose its point of view on everyone. So, so Alexander, this, this war, the reality is that it, it's not only fueling a worldwide food crisis or food shortage, but also it does speak to the energy crisis or energy disaster, as I've indicated in my opening remarks, that mm-hmm. the Minister of Trade and Industry, or should I say, mineral resources Mm -hmm. he's thinking of actually saying that we should import crude oil from russia how concerned are you as russia in all of these uh, challenges well uh see the the food crisis the looming food crisis they Mm -hmm. put it in the media and energy crisis Mm -hmm. they are not direct consequence of russia ukraine conflict exactly because uh the West again conveniently forgets mentioning one thing. Mm. There was another consequence of this war, which is US sanctions. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about food crisis for a while, yeah. um, the looming food crisis. So the UN bodies reported on the um, alarming situation yeah. in, in food area and agricultural food area yeah. uh, it, back in 2020 mm-hmm. when uh, it was a direct consequence of COVID 19's pandemic. Yeah. Even back then, be, long before special military operation of Russia started in Ukraine, mm-hmm. there were always, always, already reports that we having some uh, problems with, uh, with, with the agricultural sector. Mm-hmm. So it's not a direct consequence of the conflict. Mm. It's it's a standing. So it's, it has been. Yeah, it's a standing problem. It's yeah. been there before. Mm-hmm. Secondly, the West introduced sanctions, unilateral sanctions, which are illegal in the first place. Mm. The West has no right just to introduce sanctions because it wants to. Mm. No, it's 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 contra- it contradicts international law. But West has very specific, um, you know, attitude towards international law. Mm. They tend to substitute it with rules-based order with the rules made by the West and changed by the West every second at once. Mm. Uh, so the problem with food is not that we don't have enough food mm. or we don't have enough wheat. The problem is that we have problems with the supply chains. Okay. We even have the means of delivering the food, yeah. but we just can't do that because of Western sanctions. Mm. It disrupted the global supply chains. Yeah. And this is causes the problems. This is causes the looming crisis. This is yeah. why uh, the situation is. They speak about the so-called sea blockade mm. of the Ukrainian ports. Mm. Well, in relation to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, but uh, we should mention that uh, the grain of in in in, in uh, Ukrainian ports only amount to like one percent. Mm. of global reserves. Yeah. It cannot possibly cause a global crisis. Yeah. Just blocking, if, even if there was a blockade, it couldn't provoke a, great, a, 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 a planet-wide mm. uh, crisis. Secondly, Russia does everything in its power to resume the peaceful and safe navigation through Azov, Sea of Azov and Black Sea. Mm. But 
the only obstacle in the way mm -hmm. is the actions by Ukrainian side. Sure. Let me elaborate on this one. What, what are these actions? Mm -hmm. First of all, Ukrainian side um, mined the the basins yes. uh, near, near, that's adjacent to the ports, mm -hmm. and these mines. Uh, I should point this out uh, separately. These mines are outdated. These are not modern day uh, cutting edge okay. uh, military technology. These are outdated mines. The reason I'm bringing this up is uh, is because these mines, uh, sometimes the, the ropes that mm -hmm. hold them intact mm -hmm. in the same place, mm -hmm. they just uh, go, they just tear apart mm -hmm. and the mines go drifting. Mm. That's why it's hard to pinpoint them. Okay. Where are these mines? Mm. Uh, uh, and recently we heard the reports that some of these mines were found uh, near the shore of Turkey and Romania. Yeah. So these mines, they, they disrupt the, uh, the safe navigations. Uh, secondly, the Ukrainian authorities ho hold a lot of vessels, even foreign vessels. Yes. It's basically hostage, uh, without allow allowing them to leave the ports mm. uh, of Ukraine, mm. scaring them with Russia's aggression, but they just can't let them go. Mm. Uh, Russia has established maritime corridors, the humanitarian corridors, for the exact that purpose, yeah. to ensure safe navigation. Mm. But Ukrainians do everything in their power to disrupt its work. Yeah. Uh, they always come up with some extra conditions. Well, they always don't like something about these maritime corridors. So they do everything to keep this crisis or mm. pre-crisis situation mm. in place. All right. They have a very, why? Because it has a very good, they have a good pretext mm. to keep the sanctions yeah. working against Russia and to keep the flow of weaponry from the West and the financial support from the West going. Mm. So it's just adds to the image of a uh, victim, so yeah. to say. So uh, I want us to take a break, Alexander. When we come back, let's talk about, there's an article that I read about uh, President Zelensky. Mm -hmm. He said that it's time to stop the war, mm -hmm. but Europeans continue to actually give them weapons. So I want us to actually talk about that just mm -hmm. after the break. You're watching the article on LM24SA. We will be back just after this short break. Please do stay with us. All right, welcome back. You're still watching the article on LM24SA. We are not, of course, in studio. We are coming to you from the capital, Pretoria. We are at the Russian embassy. Of course, I'm still hanging out with Alexander Arafiev. Uh, he is, of course, in charge of the media. He is the man that speaks to the media. You'd know that the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has been making headlines for quite some time. It has been a big talking point. So, uh, Alexander, let's then talk about the article that I read. It's mm -hmm. actually from Fox News. Uh, President Zelensky mm -hmm. said that it's time to stop the war, but it would seem like the Europeans continue to fund uh, Ukraine with weapons. Does this then mean that uh, Ukraine is a battleground in a way? Oh, in a way, yes. It's more like a proxy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I can't put it into any other words. Unfortunately yeah. for Ukraine, it's made a, made a proxy mm -hmm. uh, in West's confrontation with, uh, with Russia. Yeah. Well, we can possibly agree with President Zelensky it's time to stop the war. I would say it was high time mm -hmm. to stop the war that you've been waging in Donbas mm -hmm. for eight years. Because, mm -hmm. uh, again, about Donbas, there were children uh, that are born in 2014 or, or later. Mm. Uh, imagine they are, it's 2022 now, uh, so they about seven or eight years mm. old. They should be in school, sure. but they can't go to school mm. because uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian army is still bombarding them. Mm. Uh, so these kids were born in shelters, uh, hiding from bombardments with their parents and everything they've seen mm. in their life so far, mm is nothing but bombardments and attacks by Ukrainians. Mm. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Those kids were born in conflict and they live in conflict their entire life. Mm. This must have been stopped. He could have done that, yeah. but he didn't. But if it doesn't stop then, are we likely, what do you think it's going to happen? Are we possibly going to see uh, the use of nuclear weapons? No, let's, let's, let, no, let's, okay. let's hope that uh, we will not come to that okay. because uh, there can be no winners uh, or losers anymore. Mm. It, it goes beyond that uh, paradigm 100%. because uh, nuclear war will be the last war on earth. Yeah. It's 
it goes without saying. Yeah. So it's no, we, we, we don't it even, should not even it should not, not even on table, yeah. not even be considered. This is beyond yeah. uh, be, be beyond common sense. Yeah. Yes, and uh, speaking of uh, wars and the Western's input, uh, Western input in this war, yeah, they still supply, uh, especially with well, UK mm. and uh, US, they still supply Ukrainians with weaponry. Mm. Um, because, because as I said, they're pouring oil on flames. Mm. They're interested in this conflict of going on. Mm. Um, so, unfortunately, with complete disregard to Ukrainian lives, mm. Russian lives, or anyone lives who got involved, uh, in, in, in direct uh, in direct confrontation, mm. uh, because well the 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 Kiev regime uh, he also has zero regard to what happens to its own forces because uh, they use uh, civilian infrastructure mm. to hide there or to deploy weaponry there in residential areas. Mm. Uh, they they basically using uh, civilians as as human shields yeah. to stall Russia's advance. Mm. So it's terrorist tactics. Yeah. And since uh, Ukraine has been cooperating closely with NATO instructors all this time, mm. they learned these tactics from NATO. Mm. So it's it's terrorist acts by, committed by the Kiev regime, mm. and not just in Donbas, throughout the entire Ukraine. And uh, there was another example from Odessa massacre. It was on 2nd May mm. 2014. Yeah. Uh, what happened in Odessa is when the people were Right after the unconstitutional coup took place in Kiev mm. in 2014, there were people in Odessa also protesting yeah. against the coup. Uh, but the ultranationalists and Nazis that came uh, from Kiev, mm. uh, Kiev region and Kiev itself, mm. uh, and locals, uh, they assaulted the demonstration. Oh. Uh, so they kind of dispersed it mm -hmm. and they uh, made all the protesters retreat to the trade union's house. Mm. Uh, the people locked up in, in trade union's household to save themselves and the building was torched. Yeah. 44 people were burnt alive mm -hmm. and uh, some of them in desperate attempt to save their lives, mm -hmm. they jumped out of the windows mm -hmm. and the crowd rushed to, to finish them off. It's a heinous crime, but to this day, zero investigation has been conducted by Kyiv authorities, by mm -hmm. Kyiv regime. No culprits has been found, uh, no one was sentenced. Uh, there was no court hearings, basically nothing. Yeah. So we take it that in democratic Ukraine, which mm. is bolstering of its embracing European democratic values, yeah. arson and mass murder are not crimes. Mm. Do I understand it correctly? So and uh, uh, and Nazism, the embracement of Nazism. I'll let me just speak about Nazi issue here because it was one of the one of the concerns mm. and uh, the hybrid war that's waged against Russia actually. Yeah. So Nazism here, uh, well, Europeans don't pretend the Nazism in Ukraine don't yeah. exist. That it's like made up, a fake made by Russian propaganda, but it do exists. Mm. And pretending that problem does not exist doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. And we remember, we remember pretty well what happened last time when Europe was appeasing the Nazis. Mm. World War II happened, the most destructive war in the history of humankind. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, in Ukraine, uh, in, in Ukraine in particular, neo-Nazism is raising its head again. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of manifestations of Nazism uh, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. First, they, uh, there are Nazi battalions fighting on the Ukrainian side. Mm -hmm. They're saying that they are far right or far right origins, but Ukraine is the only country in Europe that has ultra-nationalist and Nazi units incorporated in their armed forces. Mm -hmm. The only country. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, the Nazi uh, torch processions mm -hmm. in honor of Stepan Bandera and Roman Shukhevich, mm -hmm. uh, these were World War II Nazi collaborators. Mm -hmm. uh, they were responsible for numerous war crimes, including the Volhynia massacre, yeah. which took lives of approximately 60,000 people. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? 60,000 people. These people are now revered in Ukraine. They are torchlight processions in their honor, guarded by police. Yeah. Not only police don't stop them, they guard them. Yeah. Uh, they hold the commemorative events for the veterans of the Galicia, or Galicina in Russian, Galicia division. Mm -hmm. These are collaborators unit, yeah. uh, Ukrainian Nazi collaborators unit. For us, this is very alarming mm -hmm. because uh, this is actually shows the extent to what the West uh, can go to achieve its political goals. Because we can, I, I believe we can agree that one of the missions of religion is to unify. 
but instead they're using it to divide. Mm. To, they make religion contradict its very nature. Yeah. It's a very alarming development mm. because we, we need faith. Yeah. Because the religion should be a common ground. Mm. We can differ on basically everything else, mm. but religion is our, well, let's call it last resort, yeah. our last common ground. It should be that way. Mm. But no, instead, uh, they, the West, uh, again, with full acquiescence, they let the Kyiv regime uh, to divide Russian Orthodox Patriarchate mm. and make a key of Patriarchate yeah. get the, um, from Constantinople, get this mm. uh, document. I don't know how to pull it, put it correctly. Yeah. Uh, well, but it was executed with full defiance mm. of, uh, of Christian canons. Mm. So they, they stop at nothing. Mm. They, they're ready to put the world at risk of food crisis, energy crisis, they want to undermine the Christian faith, anything goes mm. if, if they, if they uh, as long as they achieve their, their political goals, anything goes, slavery goes, colonialism goes, everything. Yeah. So it was based on the same idea of the Western superiority yeah. that gave birth to Nazism in the first place, that gave birth to colonialism, mm. neo-colonialism, neo-Nazism, mm. and now this. And, and they've been doing this for, for quite a time. Yeah. They're trying to undermine the Christian faith. Weaponizing religion mm. is uh, it's horrendous. Yeah. It shouldn't be this way. Mm. Because this is bigger than we are. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, God has no political affiliation. I'm glad that you mentioned that. God has no political affiliation. Yeah. And Alexandra, thank you so very much for your time. I, I understand that you still have a lot to Perhaps maybe after the show, you will be able to actually uh, tell me some of uh, this history. But because of time, we're going to have to leave it here for today. Thank you so very much for inviting us. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you. All right. There you have it. I guess if you still have questions, that uh, part of this operation was, of course, to demilitarize the uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers. But you would now ask yourself, if Ukraine is a sovereign country. Why can't they do whatever they want? But he says that there was an agreement that you should not actually cross this line. You are actually moving closer to the east. So <laughs> I see you shaking your head. If, if I may, yeah. there were actually certain, several agreements, uh -huh. and there are also an Istanbul document yeah. on, uh, of 1999 signed under OSCE mm -hmm. in uh, Asia. Mm -hmm which clearly states that European countries, well, it's just area of effect is yeah. Europe, that's what I'm saying, European countries, mm -hmm. they should not bolster their security mm -hmm. at the expense of security of other states. Mm -hmm. So in layman's terms, I have my rights and freedoms, you have your rights and freedoms, yeah. but my rights and freedoms end right where your rights and freedoms begin. Mm -hmm. And I cannot justify violation of your rights yeah. by executing my rights. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. how it works. Yeah. In other words, Alexander says that Russia is not the aggressor. Well, that's all the time we have for on this episode of the article from myself, Innocent Simosan, on behalf of the team behind the scenes from the Russian embassy. It's goodbye and God bless.